how do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Not saying that I condone eating elephants because they are wonderful creatures. Welcome to Behind the Slate, where I sit down with fellow voice actors and other industry artists to have a fireside chat. I'm your host, Christian O'Boyle. If you'd like to know more about me, please check out my website at christianoboyle.com. In this episode, I'll be talking with Sean C. Diriger, a California-based voice actor who focuses on audiobooks. Sean loves telling a good story and has been doing so ever since he was little when his parents bought him a cassette player at the age of six. His love for reading and telling stories continued into adulthood as he graduated with a degree in communications. Ten years ago, Sean started podcasting and now runs the Screaming Pods Network alongside three podcasts that he runs. Recently bitten by the audiobook narration bug, Sean has completed three audiobooks with much more in the way. As a voiceover artist, Sean Voice has also appeared in radio and internet promotions. I've podcasted for 10 years, and this is the first year I've actually kind of put podcasting on hold so wow um so i get the uh the scheduling stuff gets ridiculous yeah for sure so podcasting and voice acting kind of melds fairly uh yeah fairly well so did you already have all the gear and you're like i'm gonna do voice acting now no, <laughs> <laughs> no. i had, i you know i I'd, I'd got a decent mic i'd got in uh uh oh gosh a sh uh shirt was it a shirt no i had no it was like a SM78, I think. No, I'm getting a 7B. I'm getting them all mixed up. Okay, okay. Was it a... Uh, uh, it's the one that, uh, it's like, it, it's all, it has swivels and, you know. Yeah, was it a dynamic microphone? Yeah, the Shure SM7B. <laughs> yeah. So, I think, yeah, I think it's a dynamic. And I was using it because I didn't have the booth and I was working, you know, I was doing it out of, in my office. And mm -hmm. with podcasting, it's like, you know, as long as there's good conversation, people don't care that, at least they didn't right. care that much. But as, you know, bigger names are starting to do podcasting and they're actually in studios, it's starting to get a little more competitive with that. But so I, I upgraded the mic and I thought, oh, this is enough to do voiceover. And I learned pretty quickly that I needed to, if I wanted to compete, you know, start yep. upgrading my equipment. So. Yep, everything needs to be upgraded in, in that sense. That's awesome. Uh, so you're working this full-time job and you're doing podcasting. What, what, what do you do, uh, as a podcaster? So, uh, so I'd gone to school for broadcast. So, uh, I'm from a small town, Iowa. So there's a school called Waldorf college in Forest city, Iowa. And they had a really good, for some reason, in this small town, they had this really good communications program. So television broadcast, radio broadcast. So, um, I decided to get my bachelor's of arts there. Um, get a communications degree um, with a uh, broadcast focus and electronic media focus. So, uh, so when I graduated, Clear Channel ha had been buying up all these radio stations. So when I got out of college looking for radio jobs, there was like no radio jobs available. Everything was either people were getting laid off or the pay was dirt cheap. And I was like, oh, I didn't go to college to make five something an hour. It was crazy because I was doing I was doing an internship and the the pay was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I don't know if I want to do that. So I kind of found myself on the road with a band and just kind of uh, doing video for them and doing whatever you know, ro glorified roadie is what I called it. <laughs> and um, and so, I, but I always wanted to get back into working with recorded voice, and I started working for an on hold messaging company, um, and they would just. They, they were a company strictly for on-hold messages. So we would have voice actors come in and spend an hour reading these little scripts, and then they would collect their paycheck, and they'd go. And I was like, wow, that's an amazing gig, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I was like, and so one of the guys had a studio, and a couple of them had studios in their, in their own houses. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. This is a small portion of their pay from our company, and I was doing all the editing in Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually that company started losing money. I got laid off, and I and – I, kind of walked away from any chance of voiceover i didn't have a good portfolio i didn't have anything to show like the only editing thing that things i had to show for were these were these little on hold messages mm -hmm. that i'd done and I, and I was awful at keeping a portfolio back then i was in my you know in my 20s and just super distracted <laughs> with everything didn't really yeah. that was never my forte was keeping a good portfolio so if anyone's listening and you're just starting work on that portfolio get that demo reel do it all early don't don't make, don't make my mistake 
yeah. and then you're, you're in your 40s and you realize, oh, I could have done this uh, a long time ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so sometimes I take the long way around here to, to get to your, your answer here. Question. No. But, um, so I had kind of given up on that and I hadn't been doing it. I, I found other corporate jobs and, and um, I work for a public utility now. And, but I've always wanted to do, you know, I always wanted to do that. So when podcasting became something that I thought about, I was like, well, I could do this. I started doing my own, my own little radio shows similar to my college radio show that I did. And I just, I found a bunch of independent bands. They all gave me their music and I was kind of just doing my college radio show and just putting it out there for people to hear. And, and uh, then I started, got the podcast bug and, and didn't really have any idea to monetize it. I, it was just kind of with my day jobs, this was kind of something to supplement my creativity and kind right. of just keep my finger on the pulse of that stuff. So, um, so I've been doing that for over 10 years wow. and I kind of split, I stopped doing the music thing and I did a more of a philosophy religion podcast called armchair philosopher. I'm wearing the, I'm wearing the t-shirt, um, <laughs> trying to monetize it. Uh, and then I do uh, a horror movie podcast called the Screamcast, And then I have some offshoots uh, once a science fiction one and, and stuff like that. But, um, but like I said, this is all has been stuff just for fun. And I never had really thought about monetizing the podcasting because that's a whole other job is, you know, I didn't have time for it fam with my family and my, my day job. Mm -hmm. There's just, I just, figure off oh, it hits it hits if it if people do the patreon great if i make a little bit of money with it just to buy some movies or fun money that's great yeah and then um go on a date so, go on a date yes uh night out with the wife but um so yes that's what brought me to podcasting it was just it was just a way for me it was like equipment was getting so cheap i, I bought these behringer just cheap behringer mics and a little interface and i plugged it into my i had an imac yeah and I was off to the races. I, I had knew nothing. I, I knew about acoustic treatment because because of my because of college um, and my internships. I worked for a recording studio mm -hmm, during mm -hmm. that, um, so I knew about it. It was just you know I was doing the podcast out of the baby room when my baby wasn't in there, and or I would move somewhere and just try to do it wherever in a closet or whatever. Yeah. And, um. So, but the podcasting that's that's I guess that's to answer your question. That's what brought me to the podcasting. So, awesome. So how does that marry and fall into the voice acting? When did that kind of start well, happening? So we, we got a bunch of um, a bunch of us have, I started up a podcast network called Screaming Pods Network. Mm -hmm. and I kind of brought in some other um, podcasts and we would kind of cross pollinate the podcast. And there was one podcast called um, Splat House and they were, they were kind of a film commentary, but they also would like to do skits and stuff like that. And I started mm -hmm. doing voices like Sean Connery voice or, uh, like a bad Sean Connery voice because I was part of the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or just me narrating like a story, like when I the first time I heard about the movie RoboCop, and I started doing these little bits. And I was like, this is really fun. And even in my office before I had the booth, it still sounded decent because I had a decent mic. I'm I know how to edit. I know how to master things to make them sound passable for a podcast. Of course. And um, I started getting the bug of like started. I wanted to do like just more skits. I started saving them aside and. And I was like, well, there's, there's something here. Um, but I was like, I don't know how I'm going to, how I would juggle trying to audition and get these gigs and then do them and juggle the day job and the family. So mm -hmm. I just kind of set them aside and then kind of out of, um, out of necessity, my wife's in real estate. And so we had, we had a, a tough year last year where all of a sudden, um she's normally had when she, when she first started she's had steady work and then all of a sudden it's just like no one was needing to sell their house and all of a sudden that side of our joint income was gone and i was like oh man you know i need need to find some ways to kind of to try to supplement that income and uh and in my ignorance i was like oh i can do voiceover well how hard could it be <laughs> <laughs> so so i learned pretty quickly that uh that that wasn't going to bring in immediately the supplemental income mm -hmm. but man i was loving the auditioning so i kind of got bit by that the audition bug so i joined a couple pay to plays and um i was thinking about doing coaching coaching still on the table for me oh, i do yeah. want to do that next year um because that is an important part um my my journey is kind of 
going uh, alternate route right now, but um, but it is important as far as, but especially I think if I want to do the commercial stuff, and that's what yeah. I realized was I got a few commercial gigs, and they're okay. Like, they're nothing for me need me to be like, oh look what I did. It's like I I kind of did this. You, if you want to watch it or listen, fine, <laughs> you know. But I I definitely need some. If I want to focus on that, I do need some some professional training to kind of re own that like, in. Mm-hmm. get the cobwebs off of my brain and kind of get back because I, I was trained in radio which is different from commercial voiceover much much different so um so it's kind of out of necessity but in but like i said in my i thought i could make quick money um but i realized that that's that's definitely not the case and i, I and I, the funny thing is i i really didn't have much to lose because we got back on our feet my wife started selling houses again mm-hmm. but i just um but man i was auditioning I was a member of um, a couple of these pay-to-play sites, and I would spend my lunch breaks an hour auditioning, just pummeling through auditions. Yep. I would come home from work straight to the studio, audition, 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 audition like crazy. Yeah. And um, I like I said, I got a few things. I made a few hundred bucks from it, but um, but man, I, I realized I quickly realized like if I wanted to do that full time, I would have to put in the full time work. For sure. And struggle and, and work at it and get some training. Mm-hmm. Um, but then a friend of mine said, well, you like reading. You read to your kids all the time. You have, you know, you're uh, – see, he heard me. He was visiting from, from Iowa. Visiting, I'm in Southern California now, so he was visiting. And they were kind of hanging out. We were, I was reading a story to the kids, to my kids. And he had remembered that. And he said, you should try out ACX. Just see. And I was like, well, okay. I'm not, I was not, I'm not really striking it with – the commercial voiceovers, I know there's a lot I need to learn. I don't know if I should even try. Uh, but I set up the account, and I, I did it, and I started getting, I started getting, uh, you know, I got one little book, and I started, started getting more. And, uh, and so now it's kind of, you know, I keep getting more. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm obviously doing something right with that. I, I guess narration and reading out loud comes more naturally to me than trying to do like a commercial voiceover or, or a character voice for a video game or something like that. Um, so it's just kind of, I'm just kind of riding it right now, you know? That's awesome. Um, so, so how do you feel that being a father of three husband, full-time job, podcast, voice acting, how do you balance all that? <laughs> well, I, I had to put the podcasting to the side for now. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of one of the things I had to do. Because it was just, I was like, well, I'll keep, I'll keep doing it. Um, and then once I started getting an author contacting me to, to narrate their book, then another one, then another one. And I was like, oh, man, something has to give here. Mm-hmm. And um, the podcasting, while it's fun, while I love doing it, wasn't scratching that itch, that creative itch that the audiobook narration was. Right. So I put that to the side for now. So I'm still producing podcasts. I'm just not as a producer um but i'm not creating my own for now so they're all in kind of a bit of a hiatus so but um but i have to keep a i have to keep a really tight schedule when i'm in the booth i have to always be communicating with my wife um and with the kids and i kind of set i had to set a a a schedule for the audio recording Mm -hmm. a, a, a vo booth schedule so I told my wife, you know, um, Monday through, through Thursday, uh, when the kids go to bed at eight o'clock, I am in the booth for a couple hours mm-hmm. until about 10 o'clock. And um, then she's usually still watching a show and we'll hang out a little bit longer and then we go to bed. Of course. And then I am up early on Saturdays and Sundays to either edit, because then I got a good block of time. I got a good three to five hours that I could be in the booth, that I can do some narration or do editing. Um, so. So having that schedule and then I'm putting all my stuff on a spreadsheet with uh, milestone dates when I need to get these certain chapters done. Mm-hmm. I have to be organized. I'm more organized outside of my day job than I am. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but I have to be to make this work. Of so course. It just just try to be as organized as, as possible and patient. Um, yeah. Sometimes I sometimes I got to, you know, sometimes the family's first, you know. a lot, mm-hmm. And it, most all the time the family's first. If something yeah. comes up. I got to drop everything in and do it. Of course. So, um, so for me, having that, having the day job, having that income makes it me able to kind of keep things a little fluid with this for now. Mm-hmm. So, 
it's a delicate dance that's for sure it, it definitely is uh i I've, I've found because i have a full-time photography job full-time job voice acting family um so because of my photography i kind of already had this decent flow with mm -hmm. family and work and then side work um and then so adding voiceovers onto it just was a, a very smooth transition right and so yeah same thing lily goes to bed i'll hop into the booth <laughs> um jesse generally goes to bed when lily goes to bed around eight o'clock we'll say we'll yeah. usually crawl into bed just to yeah. lay um so i'm like hey i'll hop into the booth for an hour or two hours and then i'll i'll hop in bed yeah. right afterwards so kind of same thing or again weekends a little bit more uh freeing and i work at home on friday so i can step into there the you booth go. Every once in a while on a friday i'm a lot we, one thing that helps me is i work my day job is five miles from my house so oh. On yeah. my lunch breaks, I'll barrel home <laughs> and knock it, out like 30 minutes of an odd, of a chapter. You know, I can for get sure. piece by piece. As long as for these bigger projects, as long as I have, I'm keeping track of what I'm doing and I know where I am. Um, I can I can kind of piece them in. Same thing with editing. Sometimes I have 10 minutes to edit something. I'll edit. I'll just chip away at everything, and that's yeah. the really only way I can make it work. For sure. You know, someday, you know, someday I would love to be scheduling out editing time in a day and i would love to do this full time but it's just just kind of embracing takes, the ride right it now a, it takes a while um so maybe what are what are some of the challenges with doing audio audiobooks in comparison to say commercial um because i know that it takes a different mindset a different kind of approach mm. and um discipline <laughs> a different yes, kind yes, of discipline yes. is the word i'm looking for um you know it's funny because like i've i've been i'm a dabbler um that has is starting to get his footing um mm -hmm. but the thing that i've noticed with my approach is i did i did do a kind of extended promotion for um for somewhere in northern california they were doing is for a courthouse some county courthouse and i was being directed by a director and it was my first time working with a director and that was stressful um so having someone hoping i'm hitting the right intuition you know Mm -hmm. uh, intonations of the of the sentence or how the performing it correctly we weren't doing it visually like it was just audio like he was yeah. just in my headset and um ah, man that was the i didn't have I, but it, it but it was also cool to have kind of immediate feedback from from the director oh let's try it this way try it this way um so and then you, then you had the self-directing kind of commercial gigs i did one radio commercial where i just kept I hadn't had the booth yet. I'll talk about the booth in a little bit. Hadn't had the booth yet. I was trying to get it right. They kept hearing something in the sound and I and I kept going back and forth, but this was self-directed. So like it took weeks to get this one little 30 oh. second thing done because they kept going back. They would, I wouldn't hear from them for a week. They would get back to me. So it's, you know, little, little moments in the booth recording something for commercial work or just a voice here and there. Um, but for audiobooks, you have this thing, this, you know, this property, this story that, that an author's poured their heart and soul into. And there's like, there's another level of kind of like, not anxiety, but you want to do it right. And I always want the author to be on board and happy. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm left on my own to basically do this thing. Uh, I don't, I don't run, I don't run any voices by anybody. I don't run, uh the only thing that they hear is my audition and then that they approve it and then i give them like a 15 minute segment of the completed book of and course. from there they go okay run with it or i didn't like that voice change this um you it's just it's a it's it's the cliche saying of you don't eat an elephant and how do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time I'm not saying that i condone eating elephants because they are wonderful creatures uh but you have to chip away at it but have a plan um you have to have a plan for it because it, it's it's a huge it's a huge property my first book was my first book was only like an hour and a half little novella um but i've since done like my longest one so far is like a 10 hour audiobook mm. and with like a space opera with gosh like 20 different characters you know <laughs> so i'm just trying to like keep all these uh character voices different and um it, it's it's so different um and it's so much more work too right. and a lot of voiceover artists 
and voiceover actors um they don't they don't it's too much it's just yeah it takes it's just too much for very little pay um right. starting out you know mm -hmm. you're climbing this mountain hoping to get somewhere but it's you, you're starting at below base camp you're you, you know you're you have to take a lot of uh not necessarily work for free but you have to i guess pay your dues in a sense to kind of like that's okay. what i'm experiencing at least but yeah um but yeah you have to split it up it's a, it's a lot different when i would do the commercial stuff i'd go in 20 minutes knock something out do a few different takes of it i'm done i collect 200 dollars <laughs> you know yeah I mean? that's, yeah that's it. you know yeah definitely definitely uh, different approach and different, again, discipline, I think is a good word. Um, are there other genres that you might be interested in voiceover? I know that you're, you said that you want to dabble a little bit more in commercial, but mm -hmm. narration, I think, would tie in perfectly with audiobooks and maybe even yeah. e-learning. Um, I've, tried, I've tried narration and the e-learning, and the, and the one feedback I get is I sound too young. Um, I have a higher baritone voice and... Um, to do the narration voice you know i, I feel like i'm yeah. forcing it when i do the deeper so i'm kind of that's where i would need i would want to do tr i would want to get a coach um mm -hmm. and be coached in that that's something that's definitely on the table because it does have it will have the same types of disciplines mm -hmm. especially if you're narrating a, a feature-length documentary or e-learning um it's just a lot more dry you're not you know yeah. um you're not doing character voices <laughs> yeah and I, um, I think it also depends on maybe the genre of narration mm, because obviously yeah. there's narration which is the genre of voiceover but then there's yeah. genres within that subgenres, i guess right uh because right. then you have uh corporate you have yep. maybe something a little bit more i don't know toys or something like yeah. that a little bit more fun and stuff like that so you're your voice will actually fit into different yeah. subgenres of the genre. Yep, yep. And and with my personality and stuff, I kind of fit more in the character voices, uh, fiction, um, things like that. Things more light and airy. Um, I mean, I guess I've done horror, and I'm able to kind of get that feeling. Um, but I'm like right now, I'm kind of sticking in my wheelhouse. Um, but I definitely. Um, I do want to grow because there's a, there's there's more money in more of the corporate stuff, more of the narration, more like nonfiction, self help books, mm -hmm. things like that, where there those things seem to sell. Um, I don't know. There there's just more of a, 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 a more of a, a more of a market, more of a market for that, I guess. Yeah. So, like I said, right now I'm just I'm right now embracing the the learning aspect, learning as much as I can on my own. Get that portfolio. And then, um, get that portfolio up because I I love. I love fiction. I love fantasy. I love, I love horror. I love sci-fi. So those are the yeah. things that I'm kind of pursuing. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of fantastic authors out there, but they're all independent. A lot of them are independent and those, while those genres are fun, I feel like they're overstuffed and, um, not as marketable because there's just so much. Yeah. So I definitely next year as I kind of go through my, I have like a three to five year plan. So as I go, um, every year I want to kind of add another layer so yeah. next year i want to next year i want to not do royalty share which you basically work for free to hopefully get some royalties from the book which is very risky but for someone who's building their prof portfolio like i am who has a day job there's no risk for me it's um as long as i'm making enough to pay for some of the production costs mm -hmm. i do most of my editing so that's fine but I do need a proofer because I don't trust myself with reading the book and hearing myself. I'm going to, my brain connects the dots between I'll flub right. a word and I won't even notice it. Um, so I, there is that cost. So this year has been like either I'm going to lose a little bit of money or I'm going to break even. Um, but I'm setting up my portfolio and then next year, hopefully no more royalty share unless it's a, the right project. Yeah. Um, and then I want to get some coaching because I do want to try to, train my voice to be more of a business sounding more a little uh be able to turn off the casual because i'm very a very casual mm -hmm. um speaker mm -hmm. and uh, so i can turn that off and kind of get that experience because that's where the that's where the money is if i want to pursue this as yeah. a as an eventual career um yes so. i have a it general is. upbeat um, I, I get told that my, my vocal type is upbeat hero, upbeat protagonist, <laughs> okay, kind of right, right. my wheelhouse. Um, so I, I've been working with a coach for, I think, four sessions now. And we've definitely really honed down 
in terms of learning the intonation of finding the voice Mm -hmm. and then falling down at the end of sentences, which kind of creates more of a uh, sure, confident, older sound. And so it's just a different approach on how I read a script Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. sound more older or sound more mature. So it's one of those things to where I've been practicing that with with her. So coach, coach is definitely a hundred percent recommended for any voice actor who is very serious in getting into voice acting. Yes. Um, And even the professionals who have been doing it for years still have coaches. Oh yeah, they'll um, still have a coaching coaching session because they want to nail a certain dialect or they want to nail a switch a different genre or stay uh, fresh. Stay fresh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it uh, learning is one of the key factors of any I think any freelance work, but I think it's also very 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 important as a uh, voice artist because the industry is always changing. Mm-hmm. They need different sounds different approaches to a script and so by staying on top of with a coach who is in the industry um they'll be able to pull out those specific things from you um and also like you said uh, you're like i would like to do narration well they will help you with that narration kind of read which then hopefully will open up your avenues and your opportunity as well yeah. Well, I was going to be, I was, I was actually planning on doing coaching this year. And then my wife made me stop spending money. <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. He was like, dude, because I'd spent, because I'd spent about two grand building this, building this, uh, the, the vocal booth and which is beautiful had, booth. And, <laughs> and she was like, I go, well, I, I have to do coaching too. She's like, well, how much is that? Is that going to cost? I don't know, two, two to three grand. She, <laughs> she holds her head, her face turned red and it was just like, I was like, oh, maybe not. She's like, well, can't you watch some YouTube videos? I'm like, no, I need coaching. <laughs> yeah. She's like, well, just, you know, make it work for now. You know, you're not, she goes, if you were laid off, I would say, yes, do the coaching. But she's like, just kind of naturally keep it going. And that's on the table. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the, this booth, because um, I, was, I, was, I was starting to get some, some work and I had done one audio book, no, two. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of my second book that I was recording called Realmbound, it's like this fantasy um, game lit fantasy or uh, lit RPG type. It's not strict lit RPG, yeah. But there is that kind of gaming aspects to it. But it's you know a uh, fish out of water scenario where a kid is thrown into a fantastic, you know, fantastical story and events. But yeah, um, I was doing that in my my makeshift booth, which was my desk, my computer. Um, I had spent money and bought a um, shotgun mic. Um, sure, what is it? What is it? Do you have that one? No, I have the Sennheiser 416. Yeah, the Sennheiser 416. Not, not sure. I'm getting. I'm thinking of my own thing. So I, I, I went to Sweetwater had a 48 month zero percent down deal, and I was like, it's only gonna cost me this much a month. I'm gonna do it. So, um, so I did that and. Um, and I was using that for the, some of the voiceover stuff that I was doing and I was using it for that book, but I had that. And then I had like, you know, like those dividers people use for like massages or whatever. I got one of those and I lined it with foam, with acoustical foam. And I would, would wrap it around the thing. And then I took two, like two of these back panels here. I had them on like this cardboard and I'll put that on top. <laughs> it's like, it's like a roof. And I would wiggle in there and sit down and, and, and do the story <laughs> and, and narrate. But I would still hear, like, my wife, like, slamming the cupboards. Mm. I would hear her yelling at the kids. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is – I can't – and I had a deadline looming, and and I'm I'm rushing to get it done. And, and I was like, this – I can't work like this. Not I, – I, there's just no way that I can do this when everyone's around. So it's either I don't sleep. Um, cause I was just getting, I mean, I was, I, I, I'd never narrated a book that long before. And I was, I'm, I was definitely not, I was definitely much, much slower. Yeah. Tons of mistakes, you know, always, always making mistakes, always having to go back. Yep. So I, I was like enough. So I talked to my wife about it and she was like, well, are you serious about this? I go, yes, I'm serious about this. Would I wouldn't have bought this thousand dollar mic. <laughs> I wasn't, I go, but I need more. And she's like, well, how much more do you need? So I was looking at um, 
buying a booth, a pre-made booth, those were like eight to ten thousand dollars, mm-hmm. you know, for a, a whisper room or there were studio bricks or um and I was just kinda like I was just like, I'm not good at construction. I was like, there's no way I can do this. There's no yeah. way I can build my own. I was I got like the DAW box or whatever some bo- some build it your own. I forget the name of it. I got oh, the instruction. Yeah. I, I, I have the DAW box. I have the DAW yeah. box plans. I have modified it. <laughs> About okay, cool. eight different times. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm still. Yeah. I have seed money from my father-in-law and my stepdad. They have given me seed money to be like, "Hey, build this booth. I know you're serious about voice acting. I believe in you. Build the booth." I'm like, uh, "Now I need room in the garage." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, man. So I had those. I had those instructions. I was watching. Uh, there's a YouTube um, channel, uh, mm-hmm. Booth Junkie. Yep. Um, he's really good. He, he's really good. Um, he had built his own and he's, what I like about him is he's kind of figuring things out too. He's mm-hmm. not, he's obviously has some coaching. He's, yeah, he's getting work, but there's, he's definitely just a dude trying to keep this, keep, you know, keep this job going. Yeah. Stay afloat. And then he had a unique situation where he had moved. And so I watched his video on how to build a booth and I was like, well, I, I was like, I guess all I need is a frame. As long as I know how to do a frame, mm-hmm. I can do the walls. Um, then everything else I can, I've, I'm, I've worked with acoustic treating. I've worked with soundproofing. I can probably figure that out if I just remember what to do. Yeah. So I, dude, I, I cleared out the garage and I bought a bunch of two by fours and I made my own walls. I don't even know if they were right, but they're the right, right thing to do. Now, like, did you do a single wall or did you do the double wall? I did a single wall, but I kind of bought like three different kinds of, uh, I bought like an MDF board, a thick, and then I bought like a soundproofing board, which is like really, it can, it can break off easily. Yeah. And then I did like another board on the outside. I kind of sandwiched them. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I um, think that's double wall because you, you'd have. So it's, it's somewhat, it's but I don't wall, have. It, it's like two ish. layers of MDF. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's ish, you know, because yeah. I didn't know how much room I had to do because I had, I wanted it in my office and I wanted it in the closet that I had a like, desk sticking out of. So I, so I wanted it in there, but I wanted freedom to kind of move around mm-hmm. um so i kind of just i sat down with a with a buddy of mine who knows how to do construction i kind of sketched out the framework idea and and i go look at this over it is, i was like am i messing this up like what you know it, it's just just a fool's errand on my part and he looked it over and he goes no i think you can do it so he goes i'll be available for you to help so i just i i, I work in autocad so on my lunch break i would stay at work and i would draw out the plans in autocad print them up yeah. and and I just, I bought the material on a credit card and I just started building it, man. Um, and it worked out. It's not 100% soundproof, uh, right. but you know, booths are 100% soundproof. Um, and uh, and I, for, I forewent the, the ventilation, which I may do later. Right. But I, I'm not in here long enough for, to really need it. Like I got to have a little quiet fan going. You can't even hear it. Yeah. Um, and I just pop the door open if I need, you know, if I need so, you know, it's going to be summertime, so I'll be sweating like crazy. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and I, I used um, – I in so in the frame, I got this um, um, oh, insulation. It's not the pink insulation. It was st- – I forget uh, what it's called. Rock wool. Or soundproof. Rock wool. Rock, rock soul. Rock soul. Wall. Yeah. Rock wool. Yeah. Yeah. So I put that in the frame, and then I we, we went to a fabric store, and I bought this really heavy-duty fabric, and I just stapled the fabric onto the – Pulled it tight. My wife helped me and pulled it and stapled it, you know, tight. Yep. So those are the walls. And then I got some Velcro and I put Velcro on this uh, foam, acoustic foam. I stuck out all of here. So so trying to piece, trying to piece kind of, and I, I saw your, your, your posts on you building it. I'm trying to piece on how you built it. You, you, you have the frame and then you have MDF on the outside of the frame and then a little soundboard on the on the outside of that and another piece of mdf on the outside of that it's no well yeah it's one on the on the far outside of the booth it's mdf yeah and, and then that acoustical um soundproofing stuff and then yeah. some and then it's like a little it's like it's um uh it's pegboard pegboard, pegboard. without the holes i just got the pegboard well i just need something to sandwich it together yeah and i had no idea like i said i had no idea if what i was doing was even going to work and mm-hmm. and um, I have, you know, I, I wanted to do, to do it differently, but I was just, I was concerned about having the booth be too small inside. I, ne- I needed to stick to a specific yep. size inside the booth 
so I can actually work in here. Yeah. Um, so, so if I would, you know, if I had a bigger place to work with, I probably would have done a, a what it, a strict double wall yeah. properly. I would have used the um, that uh, glue stuff or whatever. It's not really glue. It's just that uh, green glue, whatever, whatever it's called, green glue, which doesn't solidify. But you're, and I had bought it, but I didn't even use it. Right. Because I because it doesn't solidify. And I needed something to piece Seal it together. It. So I kind of figured it out as I went. And and the, the people that I I joined a few um, Facebook groups and a lot of the old you know a lot of the old timers. A lot of what they said was, especially if you're starting out, they're like, just make it work. Just make it work for your situation. Mm-hmm. You don't like you're already doing way more than a lot of people who are starting out do. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the you have the curtain or not, you have the uh, moving blankets. Yep. I got the the PVC moving blanket. Yeah. Like I said, I have the plans to build a booth, but I'm I'm balancing whether I'm going to do the double wall and right. just say, hey, I'm just going to get it done, or do the yeah. single wall, which will be cheaper by a lot. So yeah. I'm kind of like, what's what kind of outside things are going to be going by the booth? You know, yeah. Um, Someone said me, take take your PVC booth and bring it into the garage because uh-huh. he goes. I can guarantee a single wall is almost going to be just as efficient right. as the, the moving blanket booth, maybe a little bit more. And I was like, yeah. Uh. Well, a lot of people I see that are, you know, what I consider to be top notch audiobook narrators, they're, they don't have a booth yet. They're in their own, they're doing their own little makeshift type places. As long as you can get it sounding, as long as the end result sounds as good as you, as, as good as anything else, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, I kind of go, when I get an idea, I kind of go just overboard. I kind of want to get it. I, I wanted the booth, you know, so, right. so I right. did it. But, man, it was hard. It was, I was out of my comfort zone because I'm not a construction-minded person at all. <laughs> so what is something that you maybe wish you would have known or done differently when, when building? Um, known or done differently? Um, or you I think like, I would have done love it all. And I'm good. It's perfect. You know what? I I do love it. I I wish I would have. I need I needed to figure out if I and I didn't do a false floor, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering if that's why I still hear some, mm-hmm. like, on this side of me is like the bathroom to this office to this to this extra bedroom which I turned into my office. Right. The kids use the kids use the bathroom on the in the other part of the house. My wife likes this bathroom because she thinks the kids' bathroom is gross. So <laughs> I'll be recording, and all of a sudden I'll hear the fan go, "Hum!" Um, and right. into the booth. I'm like, "Ah, like how is that getting in?" You know? Yeah. Because I don't have I have it decoupled from the wall. It's not so, but I'm wondering if it's through the floor. So could, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and I, but I had a height issue though. So um, I was I was very paranoid of building this and and like not having it not be tall enough. Like I said, I've modified my plans like eight different times. Like stand. Yeah, so I think I think I would have figured out the false floor. Um, I think would have been the biggest thing. But mm-hmm. um, but I think I feel like I there's so much information online, and I had I hired someone a technician to take a listen to my voice through and give me some tips on how is it, how it sounds, and he was mm-hmm. and it got like two thumbs up from him. So. Um, technically I think it, I think I made it work. Nice. Do you think it kind um, of helps with, um, the regular home ambient noise? You don't have to worry about too much. The kids kind of being a little bit louder or do you still kind of have to be careful if they get a little bit more riled up? I'm like, like where this booth is, it's inside my office and I have the office door closed with a sign saying, do not disturb on it. Yeah. So, um, for the most part, I don't hear anything. Um, except if everyone's leaving, like the garage, the door to the garage is right outside my office. Of course. I'll hear that and screaming. So I'll kind of have to stop. Um, but like the air conditioners, which are right outside my office, I don't hear, Mm -hmm. um, my dog, uh, when my dogs bark, they'll bark when someone comes by. So that's something that that I can't stop that from happening. But, but uh, the, the stuff that was constantly causing a problem when I was doing that, the, the second book um most of that was gone and i'm able to kind of sit in here and just work mm-hmm. and and power through it and 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 get it done awesome. it does get hot so i'm gonna have to ventilation. figure out the ventilation soon but from everyone i talk to they say the ventilate the ventilation you know for this type of work um doesn't keep it any cooler so i found I a 
It's about a duct fan. It's about this big. Instead of using the computer fans, which are... Oh, okay. They don't do anything. Right. Duct fan is about this big. It moves about 180 CFM. So cubic feet a minute or something like that. 180 cubic feet a minute. Uh, with a decibel about 30 to 40. So it can be a little okay. bit loud. I found a way to make a muffler. So you're going to build a box and you put it uh, in there. Right, right. And that <clears throat> box is attached. Run a hose into a baffle that's on your boot. Mm. The baffle will do the turns to get the air to quiet down. And then that will then open in. Don't do a small hole. Do a bigger hole because the bigger. Gotcha. It can pull through. The smaller it yeah. kind of get, creates the whistle. Um, so that, right, hopefully, right. based on my plans, could be <laughs> enough to keep my booth at a comfortable. And, uh, of course, the outside will need to be comfortable for the inside yeah. of the booth to yeah. be comfortable. Um, but 180 CFMs at, like, 30 de decibels or 35 decibels, that ain't bad. And that's if the thing's cranked up. That's not bad. Yeah. 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 It's definitely, it's definitely something I'll have to, to figure out, but, um, um, but I'm, but I'm not in here all day. I'm only right. in a, my sessions really are only for a couple hours. Right. Um, and then if I'm editing, I, I edit in here too. If I'm editing, I just have the door open, Pop and open the fan door. on and I'm fine. Yeah. So, but, uh, it's definitely, we'll see. We're just, summer's just starting. So I may, I may, <laughs> you don't you know, may go. I, uh, I was sweating so much last night. Um, so I keep the fan off when I'm recording just in case. Yeah. And uh, I came out, came out to hug my wife and she's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Go take a shower. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but hey, it's part of the job, Wives man. If honest, like... then they will be truthful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you did mention it um, in about five years or you had this, uh, this plan. But where would you truthfully want to see yourself in five to ten years? I, you know, I really... It's funny. I didn't think I was going to like the audiobook narration, um, but I really think that's the path that I'm going to pursue because I was like, well, it's harder. Uh, it's a lot more work, but man, I am loving it so much. Um, I'm meeting some amazing authors. I'm meeting some amazing uh, audiobook narrators who are just doing it. And, and that, that whole community, the whole voice acting community has been incredible. Oh, yeah. Um, how they do embrace newbies into the fold. Yeah. And they're very good at um, giving pointers and giving tips and letting you know if, if your question's dumb. I'm sorry. You know, it's like sometimes sometimes there's enough information out there. Yeah. If you're not willing to do the work and seek it out mm -hmm. and you're just throwing it out to something that's very, very common knowledge, mm -hmm. to have them have people to kind of put you in check. And, and, you know, I had that happen a couple of times and I had to learn, oh, you know what? I'm going to do some legwork here because it's not their job to answer every single one of my questions. Yeah. Um, but the support and everyone cheering each other on, there's so much work mm -hmm. and especially in the, in the audiobook narration, there's so much work to be done. There's, you can always find a, a gig. Um, it may not be the best book. Now that's another thing. It's a whole other conversation because there's a lot of really crappy independent books out there that are, that are, that I, I'll read the audition and I'll go, no, no. Yeah. But I, I think I would like to be, I think I would like to transition from my day job into, um, in doing audiobook narration full time. I would love to do well. editing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I love editing and uh, audiobook narrators, a lot of them aren't tech, you know, they, they can, they're good at narrating, they're good at recording themselves, but they don't want to touch the edit. So yeah. there's a business opportunity there that mm -hmm. I love to do. Um, so I would love to be doing, doing, kind of doing that, staying in that wheelhouse of audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do, I, you know, I, I would love to be just doing this full time, you of know, Wh whatever it is, I would love to be working in, working in the booth. I, I've so, you know, I've, I've heard, I've been hearing a lot lately, hearing this a lot lately, a lot lately, but, um, I met an author, uh, over the weekend mm -hmm. uh, and he needs an audiobook. We were talking and, and I was like, well, if I'm your, if I'm a fit for your book, it was more of a self-help book. And yeah. I was like, well, if I'm a, if I'm a fit, I would love to do it. He goes, but you love doing it, right? I go, yeah. He goes, you found your purpose. You know, <laughs> I'm like, wow. You know, um, I never really thought about that because, you know, what how I was raised was, you know, you got to find a job, you got to get a good 401k going, you got to pass things along to your family, have good retirement, mm -hmm. and that meant sacrificing like things you love to do for that stability. But mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. that I'm 
older, I have the stability, but am I feeling, you know, good about the work that I'm doing every day? Am I feeling fulfilled? And uh, I would love to just be feeling fulfilled and putting things out there that, that, you know, that people love listening to and, of course. and doing this. So that's, that's in five to 10 years, man, I, I'm hoping to do this, be doing this full time. I'll be <sighs> 10 years, man. I'll be in my fifties. That's ridiculous yeah. to even think about. But if I'll you, be a young 50. You'll be a young 50. <laughs> but if you think about it, I mean, so many s- successful voiceover artists might start in their uh, late 30s, might start in their right. 40s, or even 50s. Right. Um, Bill DeWeese is a much older yeah. voiceover uh, gentleman, and he's very successful at what he does. And he started uh, at, at a older age i believe mm-hmm. if i if i remember yeah, he came from the, i think he came from the corporate world as, as well he came from uh, broadcasting he was a, a broadcaster He's, yeah okay okay someone yeah. came from corporate corporate world and they got a, kind of, they kind of got started doing all that stuff but i think maybe bill yeah, uh, it, uh, uh, uh mike delgadio i think was corporate i think that's what i'm, that's what I'm thinking yeah. about um but yeah i would love yeah, I, would, I would love to be doing this because this yeah. is it's like it's infectious like it's it's addicting and it is. i haven't i've never and that was the thing why I had to kind of like podcasting is great, but there's not, it's harder to get, uh, get paid for doing that. Right. Um, it's a good, it's a good avenue to have mm-hmm. creativity, create for, cre- uh, I can't talk. It's getting hot in here now. I can't talk. You're a voice actor. For what are you doing? Creativity. <laughs> I know. Hey, I don't have a script in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with a script. <laughs> Uh, no, for, for creativity, podcasting is great for, for marketing, for, mm-hmm. for just, you know what, just getting conversations out there is great because yep. we are being in a booth, you know, it, working by yourself, you don't, you know, you miss out on these conversations and it's, it's always good to talk about things that are important. Yep. Uh, um, but I, but I think like the, the ability to, ha- to have your own equipment at home and, and the possibility of getting paid for the work that you're doing out of your house with your microphone and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. I never even thought that would happen when I was, when I was going to college, I thought that I would have to go to a studio or work in a studio. I never even thought I would have something like this. Yeah. You know, yeah. In, and the way the technology so, has increased and stuff like that, it, you have more access to all of mm-hmm. this equipment and the knowledge, the community, like you said, the community yeah. is fantastic. Um, and I, I see you and I've, I've found you on Twitter. Yeah, uh, kind of poking around type thing. And I, I was like, "Oh, who's this?" I'm like, "Oh, an audiobook narrator." Okay, follow. <laughs> but I mean, I, I I love the the community. Um, I know that one of the one of my first directors that uh, talked to me he goes, "Stay away from the voiceover community." I was like, "What?" <laughs> he goes, "Just don't get involved because it, it, it's it's a mess." And I was like, "Okay." obviously getting to know the community obviously there's gonna be your ups and downs and 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 complications with other things but i mean if you mix over a thousand two thousand three thousand people in the same area of course there's going to be drama or anything (laughs) else like that but so much have i found that everyone is so acceptive and willing to help newer voiceover artists out um, even if someone's been doing it for eight years and someone else comes in, they're like, hey, welcome. And here's kind of they, they welcome in uh, type thing. So, well, I think I think it's just like with any community, because um, I, I, I have a religious background and mm-hmm. kind of came out of a religious background. That's a whole other it's not for this podcast, but but there's <laughs> but any any community that I've joined, especially online. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some sort of drama going on. There's going to be people who are going to, who want to basically take that and kind of market to you and try to take your money. And that was the one thing that I was really leery of when I first was looking at the voiceover thing. Cause I was like, everyone wants my money. Everyone wants to coach me. Oh, I've been doing this for a year and I can coach you. It's a hundred dollars per hour. I'm like, why you've been doing it a year. You don't know. You haven't, you know? So, um, so that's the thing I think to be wary of, but I think me navigating through all these other communities, mm-hmm. I kind of can see that I can, I can navigate away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just, you know, I navigate towards people who love what they're doing and are what that love to share, but you know what, if I'm going to take someone's time, I'm going to pay them for it, but I want to make sure that they have years of experience and knowledge. I'm not going to, and I'm not going to give someone money who's only been doing it, a, doing it a year. Like, 
you, you know, you have to, there, you have to, have, you have to have a good career, mm -hmm. and, you know, and be an elder in the community to impart really good knowledge to people. And oh, for sure. And yeah. I would say, like, if you're just getting started, just net, just, you know what, find really good, um, and and ask people who are the really good coaches, and they're going to yeah. be pricey, they're going to be expensive, but their their knowledge is priceless because they've yeah. been through it and they can cut through a whole lot of bullshit that that someone younger they just don't know you yeah. know even like even mike delgadio he's great boot junkie's great he doesn't know his knowledge level you know is where he's at you know and there's mm -hmm. everyone has different knowledge levels on what they do they're, they have their niche that they're good at yeah and um but take advice with a grain of salt and try stuff i oh yeah i spent a whole two months just watching youtube videos bill deweese mike delgadio <laughs> all these guys just watching him and just sucking in all the information I could. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, then also you get to a later video and they go, yeah, what I said in that earlier video two years ago, yeah, that was the wrong way of doing it. Here's the right way to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, the, they only know what they know currently. Yeah. And then they find a new avenue and they're like, yeah. oh, wow, that was a lot more complicated then. And now yeah. I found an easier way. Yeah. Um, well, I'm running into that now because I use the clicker method with my narration, which is the dog, dog clicker. And... Uh, yeah, there you go. And for me, since I edit my own stuff, it's and I'm fast at editing. It's super helpful. I don't but even a use lot of people. Clicker. I bought it and I don't use it. I use yeah, this I, method. I, <laughs> the easier, thing is, I, I don't. I, I don't need the 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 uh, clicker because I don't make. Uh, all, yeah. Audiobooks, you make say seventy mistakes in an hour. Yeah. Long form it's, narration. I need yeah, a clicker. Exactly. Short stuff. Short stuff now. Yeah, it's, it takes too long to grab the clicker to use it. Yeah, quicker. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but a lot of people in the audiobook community are saying, you know, try to move away from the clicker method and kind of edit on the fly, do punch and roll. Oh. But, um, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm torn on that, man. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't like stop. I'm in the flow, man. I don't like to stop, back up, hit the record. I don't. Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm I, the I, black sheep with that. I, I did know. my first like narration. It was for a um, I would say it's like an audio it's not an audio drama but it's for a kind of historical um reenactment of oh, cool. a, a colonel in or a lieutenant in uh the civil war and i was reading his perspective um and it was a thousand words or just under a thousand words so not not a lot i found this was so effective i went through the script made mistakes, re redid my line, and then just kept mm -hmm. on going. When I was done, I went, yep, 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 yep. And it took me five minutes to cut through all the pieces while I was listening yeah. to make, sur make sure there wasn't anything that sounded off. Obviously, yeah. a couple things sounded off. I'd cut it out and redo it, punch in. Yeah. Um, but other than I use, that, yeah. I use ooh. punch in later. I use punch in when I'm doing the pickups. Yeah. Um, when I do, because I'll record everything. I just like this method better. Yeah, and who knows? A year from now, I might it may be different. And it's funny because in the voice actor, a lot of voice actors will go to a studio, like the ones that you've seen Hollywood and stuff. They go to the studio, and you know the 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 tech will tell them, "Oh, take that in, take it again." The tech's doing all of it. Mm -hmm. um, even the self-directed long-form narration, just the clicker method. You know, mm -hmm. you, you get it done. Um, I've never heard of the punch and roll as you go until I started talking to other audiobook narrators. Right. And um and it's it's I feel like it's specific to them because a lot of audiobook um narrator the, the editors in that community they won't take a full raw audio. They want they don't they won't do it. Um right. you have to have it kind of pre edited as you go, I guess, for them to touch it. Oh man. Um, that, that, my that, editor yeah. though, he's awesome. My editor, he does he does commercial stuff and he goes just send it to me with all the clicks i'll edit it i'm like awesome okay yeah <laughs> you're, yeah you're hired you're for any pay any pay Mine. per hour gig um i'll send to an editor because that's yeah. i'm i got money for the gig and i can um pay him to do the editing and i can move on to the next thing of course but so it, anyway it's weird it's just uh but I, i've always said like to anyone asking advice i'm like i'm new so my advice is going to be very you know take it with a grain of salt but I would say do what's comfortable for you. However, the best way, if however you can give the best possible read mm -hmm. in the booth, uh, do that. Do yeah. what works because what matters is the final product. Yeah, you want the flow yeah. to work best for you. Yeah. So. And I, I find if I stop, 
go back, cut, and then redo it, I lost the character. Yeah. Ex especially yeah. when you're doing character work. If you're in and this I, character, I, yeah, you just you don't want to get out of it. And that's for me, like if I'm doing voices, I'm in the character. I'm in, a, I'm in, I'm doing some monologue with the villain, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't lose it. I got to keep going. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now you went from the Sennheiser 416 to that. It's a Sennheiser. Um, is, uh, I'm going to go look. What is it? What is it? I'm awful at knowing. Oh, the MK4. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which So I'm doing this for audiobook narration specifically mm -hmm. um, because it's, the the 416 was a bit harsh with my voice actually um, i i heard it's a little harsh for long form yeah uh, kind of work just because of its its extra boost in clarity mm -hmm. so that's why it's really good for video games mm -hmm. and commercial script and promos but right. anything for long form i think a, a condenser like a, a, yeah. a normal condenser microphone would so, be i just did the research this wasn't i was of course there's mics that i would like to have but they're you know they're a little out there this was very this was actually i did the research on it very very affordable like 300 bucks there's another mm -hmm. version that's 400 the next level up i guess mm -hmm. um but i think it's made in the same factory that does like newman mics or something like it's made as some it's they're they're yeah. made in like the same with the same some of the same components yeah um and it definitely warmed up my voice for the long form mm -hmm. yeah the 416 is good if you're if you're uh doing something with background noise sound effects music because it cuts through that you for a long form narration with no music i guess if you're not doing a star wars book i guess star yeah. wars books they are everything <laughs> <laughs> maybe for a star wars narration if i ever get that i would have to do to use the 416 right but this one for me with no music it it i liked how it sounded yeah, so, it's a little bit more flatter. It's a more yeah. even neutral t uh, tone. Yeah, I'm, I don't yeah. have to mess with the EQ as much. I yeah, that makes sense. EQ and yeah, with this, I just got this maybe a week ago. Um, and I have definitely found that it, in, in clarity in voice, it, it has definitely improved the clarity of voice. But I can definitely tell that after a long time, it would be a little bit... It, it would it'd probably get a little um, tiring to listen to. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I, I went from the Audio Technica AT twenty thirty five um to this. And this yeah. was obviously thousand dollar mic, hundred and fifty dollar mic. This <sighs> sounds so good. It's a great mic. The, the other one didn't sound bad. Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah. It's all about doing the research and finding the biggest bang for your buck. And then, and then having a list of things you can afford, you know, as, and as you start getting more, um, you know, more gigs, you can pay in reinvest into your equipment. And that's yeah. what I'm at, at the point right now. I'm like, I'm in break even. Um, I, I kind of, you know, I, I get, a, I got a little gung ho, yep. um, but I want to break even this year. And then, uh, this, this, <laughs> this, I'm, I'm not going to break even this year <laughs> because of this, but yeah. I uh, got, you know what? I got, um, I randomly got a gig with Hachette Audio doing these um, children's books, Peter Powers books. And that was a 250 per finished hour hmm. um, gig for, you know, for six books and then a couple of the children's books for this thing that they're doing called Wonder Books. They're, yeah. they're hardbound books that actually come with the player um, that they're rolling out. And, um, and that actually, I got that check and that actually, in my mind, I was like, well, there's the booth paid yeah. off. Um, but then I had to pay some post-production costs on some other royalty share stuff. But of course, you know. But it's all about right now making this work, and then and then next year take it up to the next level and really get the business plan going. So, awesome! But uh, it's a fun ride, man. And it is a great, awesome. a great <laughs> ride. So where can people go to find more about you and more about your work? People can go to uh, screamingpodsvo.com. You mm -hmm. can go to screamingpods.com is the is the podcast network. There's mm -hmm. a you can click VO. You can go to there. ScreamingPodsVO.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, ScreamingPodsVO on Twitter, or my personal is Sean C. DeRager, but you can find me through that. And uh, and uh, I think those are the couple places you can find me right there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on, on the show. Of course, Christian, man. Anytime. Thanks for listening to Behind the Slate with guest Sean C. Duriger. If you like the episode, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button to stay notified. I look forward to seeing you again. Uh, 
I'm, I'm, I lost the word, but you understand. <laughs> Is this, am I f***ing it up? Oh, sorry, f sorry, sorry if I swear. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had... What's it called? I, I know the name of it, and I can't think of it. <laughs>